First, the same international forces and their opposition puppets which frustrated the early birth of the AIDC, which destroyed Prime Minister Gordon, now turn their malice, their spleen and their venom on an Australian government which stands in their path as they seek to enlarge their grip on Australia's resources of minerals and energy. Ambassador Marshall Green has said that per capita, Australia is the world's most resources-rich nation. Australia's proven recoverable reserves of minerals and energy are worth, on a present-day calculation, $5,700 billion. I repeat, $5,700 billion, an astronomical figure. They will be worth in the future even more. They represent a security ratio of $1,425 Australian in assets for every dollar of our proposed borrowing. The best security ever offered to, us, to overseas lenders. Last week, though, in Tokyo, I negotiated with the Japanese steel mills a five-year coal export arrangement, which is worth over $10 billion US. It is over two and a half times the value of the proposed emergency loan, the subject of this debate. The whole of the opposition case is based on the alleged enormity of the loan transaction. Our proposal, sir, for borrowing is the proverbial peanut compared with the depth and the range of Australia's resources. The loan transaction was for the necessary infrastructure for the emergency development of those resources based on the energy crisis. The profit alone from the loan transaction would have been one and a half times the value of the, the loan. When one speaks there in billions, it is difficult for people to understand the true measure of Australia's real and potential minerals and energy wealth. Our offence in the eyes of these international forces is to borrow through official Australian government channels capital sums on the credit of Australia to cope with an energy crisis. Their alternative is for those funds to come as foreign investment, foreign ownership. These are the tragedy of Australia's development hitherto. The orthodox financial institutions are unable to, to cope with this unprecedented flood, just as the orthodox economic advisers of some of the world's major governments were unable to anticipate the results of overdependence on cheap imported crude oil. Today they are bewildered and lack plans to correct the distortion in the world economy. Australia, although more fortunately situated than most, still imports nearly $700 million Australian worth of crude oil yearly. This will be further escalated by the decision of the OPEC countries to further increase crude oil prices in early October to match the impact of world inflation on their oil incomes. A projected increase of up to 35% could raise Australia's payments to one billion annually. In this situation, which I forecasted in April 1973, it was no less than my duty to present to the Prime Minister and my senior colleagues a plan for direct overseas borrowing of $3 billion Australian, which is equal to $4 billion American, to deal with this menace. $450 million Australian of our import bill can be replaced with the full availability of natural gas throughout Australia in substitution for imported crude. This economy alone would have aggregated in seven years the total projected loan. The full list and cost <coughs> of urgent energy items was presented not only to my co-signatories of the Executive Council Minute, but also in the presence of the Secretary of the Treasury and the Governor of the Reserve Bank. The Secretary of the Treasury, sir, has consistently opposed the project. Apart from the completion of the natural gas pipeline from Cooper Basin, Palm Valley, Dampier, Perth, provision was made for the 84 miles of submarine pipeline from Dampier to the North Rankin production platform. Provision was made, in my calculations, for the necessary petrochemical plant at Dampier. 
to extract the natural gas liquid for conversion into motor spirit in other derivatives. The cost of three uranium mining and milling plants in the Northern Territory and assistance of the Cooper Basin Natural Gas Consortium, in which the Australian Government is now a partner, was included. Also, the cost of the plans to economise in diesel fuel consumption by the electrification of the heavy freight rail areas of New South Wales and Victoria. Of current significance was a further provision for the upgrading of the four major coal exporting harbours of Eastern Australia, Hay Point, Gladstone, Newcastle and Port Kembla. The need for over 200 million for this purpose alone is proven by the recent contract with the Japanese steel mill to which I have referred. May I say this, sir, that despite the presence in, in, in Japan of Mr. Anthony doing his ineffective but unpatriotic best to, us, to discredit Australia's government last week, I was able to negotiate a, a very, very satisfactory agreement. Sir, to maintain and increase ownership by the people of Australia of our own resources calls for immense sums of money to which the Prime Minister has already referred. In our probings for loan funds, we're in such well-known company as that of Sir William Gunn, member of the Reserve Bank Board, who has been busy in Europe doing the round. Mr Lang Hancock has also announced his interest in, in such sources for borrowing for the development of his iron ore interest in Western Australia. The issue, sir, in short, is who will own Australia? It is a major issue on which the next federal election will be fought. Ignoring the smears and the sneers of an opposition, which has to its internal discredit the current majority foreign ownership or control of Australia's mineral and energy resources. 